ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وزوجه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد we praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way he deserves to be praised and we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his companions, his wives, and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense. Um, in the month of Ramadan, there are many lessons to be learned. Uh, and very often, the theme which we go through on yearly basis before Ramadan in the beginning of Ramadan and throughout Ramadan is learning about the different matters that are pertaining to fasting uh, or to the prayer at night or things which we can still consider to some degree to be seasonal. Meaning some engage in these acts of worship after Ramadan is over and some don't until that next Ramadan comes around. But it's always a seasonal discussion. While we miss out on other matters, which not only we go through or deal with um, the whole year, rather our whole lives. And yet, I have observed, because of the month of Ramadan and other occasions, that there's some major unawareness among Muslims about these subject matters. You want to use ignorance, you could. But the lighter term is unawareness. Even though it's a very uh, simple, straightforward air, subject matter, it's a potential, it's a fertile soil for, for a lot of reward, for seeking Allah's or attaining Allah's forgiveness and being admitted to paradise on something that you are forced to some degree to do. Something that you can't live without. Something that you are basically in a situation where it's inevitable that it will happen. So how is it that we manage to live our lives absent-minded about this? Remains to be amazing. But it's not that surprising anymore because, because of these things, Muslims are in the condition they are in today. It is because of the abandonment of these very uh, basic sunan from the Prophet ﷺ that we overlook intentionally or unintentionally that has caused us to be in this predicament. It is nothing else. It is the main fundamental reason. So can anyone guess what is it, since the title is The Fast, Feast and Furious, uh, what is it that could, we could be discussing here that is inevitable in your life and yet we are very much unaware of its details and etiquettes? All right. No, that's that's way too many responses. Very few. Yeah, well, yeah. Now everybody knows. Huh? What is it? What is it that you do on daily basis? Eat. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. That is actually the right answer. It's nice when you come in and then you give the right answer. It doesn't happen in school often as good as happening in a lecture. Eating. You'll be amazed. And I ask you kindly to, to do the following. As we go through the etiquettes of eating, I want each one of us to count how many you know and how many you didn't know. You don't have to share the results at the end of the lecture. But do a self-evaluation. How many of these things you had never heard of? And therefore, you had been or you have been missing out on a great deal of reward on daily basis for something that you're doing anyways, simply because we haven't had the time to go through them. If you get more than 50%, that'd be great. If it's less than 50%, ouch. And we could use this as a benchmark for many other things in our deen. 
that we have some major unawareness concerning. So, we're gonna go through the process, and because it's Ramadan, of course, uh, and Ramadan, we said, is the month of fasting, but we always discuss food in the month of fasting. It's just one of these ironies, where in the month where we're supposed to abstain from eating, it seems to be the major discussion, all the ads are about food, supermarkets are about food, the wife is cooking all day, it's all about food. But how do we deal with this food? That's the question. So the first thing we're supposed to do before we eat is wash our hands. Now, I want you to bear in mind that a lot of the things which come from the Prophet ﷺ, we don't, not a lot, everything we get from the Prophet ﷺ, we don't need any scientific medical proof or uh, verification or endorsement for us to say, oh yeah, okay, now we can practice this. Many Muslims are wary of whether to apply the sunnah or not, depending on whether doctors endorse it or the opposite of that. And the truth is, we would not mind that there's an endorsement, but we shouldn't care. Because part of our belief, and this is something very sensitive, maybe over here we're a little bit more, alhamdulillah, in a safer area in the West, it's completely different. We have to believe truly that the Prophet ﷺ did not speak from his own desires. Everything he shared with us pertaining to the matters of the deen is a revelation from Allah, be it the Quran which we hear or the Sunnah, his own words ﷺ, were not from his own in the sense that they didn't happen without Allah's guidance or Allah's Interve uh, uh, interference. If he were to say something or do something which Allah Azza wa Jal did not uh, uh, accept, then there would be revelation to correct that. And we all know many ayat in the Quran where a correction was made to the Prophet Sallallahu The easiest one is Abbasa wa Tawalla. So nothing was left unattended. Therefore, whatever he said is from your Creator. If you don't trust your Creator, then who do you trust? If you're gonna second doubt what Allah Azza wa Jal revealed, then we have a major issue in our belief system. And this is why people often, or the trend nowadays is to turn atheists. That's the trend. To leave the deen altogether. And they begin with these little things. A lot of science being pumped into the brain, no knowledge of the deen, and then what it seems to happen is that all that scientific information goes all the way in and it kicks out everything that has to do with aqidah and iman until there's nothing left. Then the person becomes scientific. Everything has to be scientifically proven. While scientists are the most confused creatures on earth. They spend, they spend years in the laboratory doing tests and whatever only to find out that there's a surprise at the end. Or that this university came up with this study, which almost was like a scientific fact. And then, ta-da, some other guy says, you know what, forget you guys. Like this uh, very, right now, the whole thing about uh, the homosexuals. You know, the whole idea that you can't blame them. They were born this way. They were born this way. You can't blame somebody for being born a certain way. This is the, uh, the rhetoric that you hear. And then a recent study from a you know, 50 year uh, university of experience said, get out of here with that stuff. That's not true. And that if you actually tell that person that it's justifiable, you're not helping them in any way, shape or form. Because these people live a, a disturbed life. The rate of suicide, the rate of depression, the rate of so many, so many different things that from a negative perspective are very high among those types of people. Transgenders and what have you. It's an abnormality that the people trying to force, force us to believe it's normal. So if you're going to rely upon science, who do you trust now? Were they born this way or were they not born this way? The only solution for this is religion. It's Islam. What does Islam say? And forget about the scientists. If they, if they agree, congratulations, that's good for them. If they don't agree, that's too bad. That's too bad. We don't need their opinion. So, Again, this is an intro or a prelude so we can understand that these are the etiquettes from the sunnah 
If you have heard something scientific or medical to the contrary, throw it in the ocean. And stick to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Washing the hands, it's common sense. Because that's where you're going to have different you know, microbes or bacteria. And so you don't want to touch the food <coughs> and wind up eating it or harming others. Secondly, and this is something that many might not know. Okay, remember to count what you know and what you don't know. Asking about the food which is being presented to you. When some food is presented to you, it is from the sunnah to inquire about that which is being offered. Now, there's a fine line between uh, being respectful and being rude, right? So I'm saying this, you have to understand this in the context of not being rude. Here comes the microphone, like I'm not loud enough already. Zakallah <laughs> khair. Well, how is that going to work? That's not going to work. I don't think I need the mic. Whatever. Okay. What was I saying? Yes. So if a food is presented to you, you're not going to be like, what in the world is this man? That is not how you ask. For example, or you don't become suspicious like you go to a brother, you know, here in Jeddah, and then you tell him, is this halal? Is this chicken halal? Or is this meat halal? This is يعني, a form of tanatta. It's a form of being extreme. Uh, unless you really follow the opinion that certain food which is exported or certain meat exported from I don't know which country is questionable and you don't trust anything around you and therefore you have this issue, then even if you want to make that inquiry and you have some reservation, you have to go about it in the nicest way possible. But fundamentally speaking, it's about inquiring about the food <coughs> because you may have an issue with the food. What is the evidence? The hadith of Khalid bin Walid. When uh, the Prophet ﷺ was presented with a lizard, which was brought from Najd, and he didn't know. And so when he was about, the food was offered to him, and it was his habit to ask about the food, or what it's called at least. When he was informed that this was a lizard, the Prophet ﷺ withdrew his hand. He did not want to eat it. And so he was, uh, Khalid al said, is it haram? Is lizard haram? He thought when the Prophet ﷺ refrained from, from eating it, this could be forbidden. He told him, no. It's just that, Laysa ta'amu qawmi, this is not the food of my people. This type of food is not found among my people, and I have concern that I might dislike it. And so he didn't, yet Khalid bin Walid, in front of the Prophet ﷺ, reached out and ate some, and the Prophet observed him. So the scholars use this particular event as an evidence about trying to find out what the food is before you start eating. This becomes way more important in the West. Maybe alhamdulillah here, <coughs> we don't have this concern. But in the West, you can't just go to some random restaurant and order anything without actually knowing the content. I was in the Philippines as many of you know recently. And to my surprise, a lot of the foods have bacon by default. Like any type of pasta, any, what is it, the carbonara, the, the fettuccine thing? By default, when they mix the sauce, they mix it with, with bacon. And so, I couldn't find technically, except maybe one restaurant, where that food, that, that item particularly, didn't have the bacon already there. Everything else did. And if you don't ask, you wind up eating it. And another tip for those living in the West, is if you are of the opinion that eating the meat of the people of the book is permissible, as in you are in a Christian country, or a Jewish country, if that is somewhere there, and you follow the opinion that it's halal to eat that food, and that is a valid opinion among many of the scholars, without having to inquire, you just have to say bismillah. You have to also be mindful of the fact that in the kitchen, a lot of the stuff is mixed. And so it is part of the responsibility that you have to ask them to clean and wash whatever they're going to use to prepare your food so that there's no contamination from any type of swine. So if you go to a pizza place, you can expect that they're going to cut that pepperoni pizza with the same 
uh, knife or whatever they call that, that they're going to cut your vegetable, vegetarian pizza. And so you have to tell them that you have some uh, allergy, if you want to call that. I tell them spiritual allergy. Have a spiritual, I cannot eat bacon, it will harm me. And so you emphasize that they need to clean the knives and the pots and whatever they do, <coughs> excuse me, before they cook your food. That is important. So that you don't wind up eating something bad. Thirdly, hastening to eat the food when it's brought out. So it is the, from the etiquette of the host is to immediately bring the food out if it's available. Because some people invite you for dinner and then you eat like two hours later uh, and the food is like right there in the kitchen, like wait for you to starve to death or start looking at your watch many times and start saying, you know what, I think I gotta go. They're like, okay, fine, we'll bring the food. It's, it's actually nice to bring out the food right away and it is nicer for you to eat right away. Otherwise, the host might start having thoughts. You know, what's the issue? So hasten to eat. Of course, again, there's always, a, everything I mentioned, there's a fine line between being silly and between being respectful. It's like, he didn't even put the plate down, you already reach out and have some. We're not referring to that. Okay, that's just too much. Type. We all know mention in the name of Allah. Is it obligatory or recommended? <coughs> Obligatory or recommend? Do you have to do it or it's nice if you did it? You have to do it. You must say, you must say Bismillah. You must say Bismillah. Our problem is hunger. Brother, yani, nine out of ten times, he was too hungry to remember. One time, when he wasn't that hungry, he actually thought of Bismillah first. But I mean, come on. This is something that we need to train ourselves. It's a matter of training, discipline. That before I eat, it's like a habitual. Habitual doesn't mean that you turn it into a ritual where you don't think about what you're doing. <coughs> but we have to learn how to consistently say Bismillah. Tayyip, you were so hungry, you started eating, you didn't say Bismillah. Khalas is too late or can you fix it? How do you fix it? Bismillah awwaluhu wa akhiruh. Or in another hadith, fi awwalihi wa akhirih. Ma fi ishu. Ma fi ishu. No issue, you can use both. Right? Then Bismillah in the beginning and at the end. Many people actually, nine out of ten times they say this at like the last second. After they're full and stuffed. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, right. Bismillah fi awwalihi wa akhirih. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, brother. Give yourself a break. Tayyip. Uh, now let's deal with the etiquettes while eating. This was before eating. While eating. <coughs> eating with the right hand. Ay, 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 ay. This is where we have it, man. This is where it gets painful. And throughout the years, nothing changed. I continue to somehow, by the decree of Allah, sit in the presence of people that just can't seem to submit. And let me be very frank with each one of us. If you want to test yourself for arrogance and pride, that is the test right there. Don't look at the dress code and if your thobe or your clothes are fancy or not, because that could be arrogance and it could be simply following the sunnah. Because we know from the hadith that the man said, he liked to have a nice outfit, nice pair of shoes. Allah is beautiful, he loves beauty, no issue. Arrogance is... Huh? بَطَرُ الْحَقِّ وَغَمْتُ الْنَّاسِ it's, it's rejecting the truth and belittling people. And this is exactly where it happens. How often do you tell a person, eat with your right hand as they are eating with the left hand? And how often do they have a story? There's always a story. Rarely do you see someone say, Jazakallahu khayran. And they make that transformation. The fundamental reply is, bro, I'm uncomfortable, or I'm left-handed, or I have a Pepsi and a sandwich. So how do you want me to do this now? Yeah, and you look at all, it's all, so many stories. I have two items at the same time. Do you expect me to have to put one of them down, to move it to the right hand and eat? La, ya sheikh, excuse me. La, no, I told you to climb a mountain and jump off the cliff. Yes, I expect you to do just that. Yani, how, what are you, a beast? 
Do you have to have two things at the same time? Take it easy, man. So what? Put the freaking thing down and pick it up with the right hand and then, you know, switch, swap if you have to. Eat and drink and simultaneously. And we're going to go into the amount of food and all that stuff later, but it's weird. It's weird that they, you can't manage something so simple. And the whole excuse about being left-handed, wallah, doesn't fly. It does not fly at all. Left-handed, those who play basketball know. You could be right-handed and you learn how to shoot with the left hand and do a layup with the left hand. You could play tennis with the left hand. You could be left-handed, eat with the right. In fact, many left-handed people wind up eating with the right. Oh, how is it possible that the left-handed person is able to eat with his right by mistake, but you right-handed person, you know, can't seem to fix it. You have to eat with the left hand. And that's your excuse. I'm sorry, left-handed person uses that, the fact that he's left-handed as an excuse. It's not, it's not true. And la qaddar Allah, you lost your hand. You can eat with your foot? If you're left-handed and you lost your left hand, are you going to convince me that you will eat with your foot or you will you train to eat with the right hand? He said, I'm going to train. So you're able to do it. Thirdly, it's putting something in your mouth, akhi. You're not sewing a thawb or a garment that requires this accuracy and, and you know, precision and concision to do it, it's moving an item from the plate into your mouth. You're gonna tell me because you're left-handed, you, you go like this, put it in your eye, put it in your ear. Say, brother, wallah, I'm left-handed. Yeah, Shaykh, khalas sabat, yani, bismillah, put it in your mouth. Stop the nonsense. All this is bluffing, bluffing, bluffing for nothing. It's pride, wallah, it's pride. This is why at the time of the Prophet wasallam, a man was eating with this left hand. And the Prophet told him, Kul bi yaminik, eat with your right hand. He said, I cannot. He said, may you never be able to. And that man was never able to pick up his right hand towards his mouth. The scholars say, the only thing that prevented him is arrogance. Because it's illogical that you can't really pick up some food with your right hand. It's uncomfortable, sure. But you get used to it. Anything that you do often, you get used to. That's one thing. The other thing is, the magical, we've discussed this in other lectures, that magical finger does not work, akhi. The person who has like the glass with his left hand, and then they bring that right, the index finger, which is the magical right hand. And then he's drinking and he puts his finger there. Like, what are you doing? Uh, right now it's the right, I'm supposedly drinking with my right hand. Why? Because of his finger. Yaqi How does that work, man? The, what, the, what, why didn't you grab it with the right hand? Here's a justification, huh? Because my hand is greasy. Oh, your hand is greasy. That Pepsi can or whatever it was. Were you going to take it home with you? After you finish drinking, do you pack it in your bag and go? Or you throw it away? You throw, yaqi, get it greasy. If it's a cup. That you're going to wash, or do you not wash cups? If you don't wash cups after you use them, I understand. That you're avoiding your greasy hand, you're avoiding touching the cup because that cup doesn't get washed, so next time you drink with it, it'll be pretty nasty. Sure, but I don't think anyone could say that. You say, we wash the cups after you use them. Yeah, akhi, get it greasy. And wash it afterwards. There is no excuse whatsoever in this world, on this planet, to eat with the, and drink with the left hand. No, no excuse. Unless someone has a major, a, a real disability, in which case we all zip our mouths. Someone who's truly incapable, injured. La qadr Allah, you injured your right hand. Nobody, the deen here comes with ease and flexibility. And no issue, you can eat with the left hand because of a valid excuse. But those without the valid excuse, it's not gonna work. So whatever you're drinking, it's okay if you get it dirty because you're using your right hand. It's okay. It will be washed or will be thrown away afterwards. Tayyip. <coughs> Eating from what is directly in front of you. This applies to certain types of food that are being shared by multiple people. Especially if the food is like soupy, as in it has, it's like liquid. Or something that might disturb the other person. So if you have a plate and a bunch of brothers are sitting, let's say we're eating full and tamiz, which we hope we will do afterwards inshallah, you don't want to reach out to the brother's side and eat right from in front of him, dip your fingers, mashallah, right on his side of the plate, and then because that part looked a little more delicious than your side. This is where the sunnah says that you may not do so. 
Because a young man was doing this in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Ya, ya Ghulam, young man, say Bismillah, eat to the right hand, wa kul bin mayalik, eat from that part which is nearest to you. So that's from the etiquette of eating. Okay, what about if the food is like dates? If it's dates, for example, the scholars say no problem. There is no issue that you may reach <coughs> to the middle of the plate or the side of the plate to pick up a particular date that won't repel the person that you are eating with. Um, eating with three fingers. It is the sunnah to eat with three fingers. The first three fingers that the Prophet ﷺ used to use when eating. Uh, the scholars say if there's a certain type of food that requires using more, it's not the end of the world. But it is criticized as being an inappropriate way of consuming food because it suggests like this beastie mode while eating. Uh, needless to say, using forks and spoons is completely fine. Okay, it is completely fine. You're not obliged to eat with your fingers. It is preferred depending on the food item. But a Muslim has to also be aware of his surroundings. And you have to understand that we are representing Islam. And so anytime you are in an environment where there are non-Muslims, what may be normal to us is often abnormal to them. Yani, if I walked in right now to the bathroom, and I saw Shuaib's foot in the sink. Am I going to be looking at Shuaib like, what in the world are you doing? No, Shuaib is making wudu. But if, uh, if we were in some other country, and Shuaib at the airport has his foot in the sink, and some non-Muslim came in, is he going to be wondering what's going on? For sure. And he's going to think, man, I was going to brush my teeth right over there, and pull my face right there. And you have your foot. So what is okay? I'm not going to be mad or tripping because he's making wudu. I understand. It doesn't repel me, but for the non-Muslim, that's a whole nother ball game. Similarly, some of these things which we do, even though they're normal to us, for the non-Muslims, the, the bottom line, the bottom line is it's a bad image. You understand? It's a bad image. And so once there's flexibility in the deen, then you have to also weigh things out, the harms and the benefits. We're not saying every time there's a sunnah, you abandon it for the sake of the disbelievers. Please don't misquote and misunderstand. But what we're saying is if there's, an, if there's flexibility, meaning if I'm in a restaurant and there are non-Muslims, if eating with the fork is more appropriate to my environment than eating with my fingers, then I make that choice. Seeking Allah's pleasure, right? That I'm trying to not have the people look at me like, what is that person? Because it's not normal for them that you're going to eat spaghetti with your fingers. It's just, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. You understand? So you, in, you investigate you evaluate your environment and you act accordingly. Where there's a leeway and there's a da'wah benefit, then you make that choice. But not on the expense of compromising everything. Some people completely abandon everything in the sunnah because the people don't like it. That's the type of extreme which is not allowed. Especially when the sunnah is obligatory, meaning it's a sunnah as in it's from the Prophet's hadith, but it's obligatory in the deen. There, you have to do what you have to do, whether the people like it or dislike it. Type. Here comes a topic where it's, it's, it conflicts with our culture, at least my culture. I don't know, you guys can share with me your feedback about your culture. Uh, dropping food on the floor. So my whole life, I was raised to believe the following. If some food falls on the floor, there's a shaitan ready to lick it. He licks the food right away. Okay, so if the shaitan licks it, are you supposed to eat it afterwards? No, you're supposed to throw it away. So our whole life, if we drop some food, it's gone. And you're not supposed to eat it because as they say, shaitan la hasa. The shaitan licked it, you can eat it. You grow up, you learn Islam, and you find out that this is the opposite of the sunnah. Rather the sunnah says if you drop some food on the floor, depending on the type of food, if it's the type of food which is not going, I mean you didn't drop it in mud, you dropped it on the floor, 
and it's some it's not dirty in a sense that the some nasty thing came into it then you're supposed to remove whatever harm say bismillah and eat it and not leave it for the shaitan so that is the actual sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because you don't know where the blessings is you don't know where the blessing in the food is <coughs> And we have to teach our children that. Now, of course, if if that if the food becomes like if it becomes disgusting, or if it's the type of food where it's going to be dirty or something of the sort, that's a whole nother discussion. We're talking about the item or the food item that falls, which is not damaged by this fall and is still edible. You drop a tomato and it goes into the floor, you're not gonna probably pick that up after it mixed with everything on the floor and eat it. Okay, so usually it's a dry item that you can afford to pick up. Like a grain of rice or seeds or something of the sort. Type. Here's another one which many might not know. Not eating while reclining. And even though, <coughs> excuse me, there's a difference of opinion among the scholars about what is reclining, how to define it. Uh, Imam, uh, Imam Malik and others say any type of reclining is disliked. So whether you're reclining on the right hand or the left hand, or you're just chilling as they say, that is actually not from the sunnah. It is not from the sunnah because the Prophet ﷺ said, I do not eat whilst I'm reclining. And so you want to avoid any type of position, uh, you know, like with the Sultan, as they show them in, uh, back in the day, well, they have this people with the fan, and the Sultan is just on his side, and the fruits in front of him and all that stuff. That kind of, you know, arrogant... Uh, prideful situation or posture is what you want to avoid. Uh, now we're going to discuss, uh, also they, the scholars add, not spitting or blowing your nose while eating, unless that is necessary. Obviously you're eating among people and you go blow your nose, that's just not really an appetite uh, opening behavior. Uh, etiquettes after finishing eating. Washing the hands. And the scholars recommend that you add soap. The scholars recommend that you add soap to water. So now you wash your hands before and you wash your hands after. That's what Islam teaches us. And that is cleanliness. That is the epitome of cleanliness. So that you are clean to yourself and to people around you. And no, using your clothes is not okay. And I'm saying this for the kids specifically. So he's eating chicken or whatever and then, you know, I'm clean now. Or with the side of the pants and so when you see the kids walking, you see like ketchup over here and mustard down there, mayonnaise at the bottom. Because they have the tendency to use their clothes. Uh, to, so, you know, if you're really hungry, you can eat his clothes basically. You'll have plenty of taste and spices and variety of stuff. Uh, no, you gotta learn. You teach the children that this is not appropriate. There are tissues and manadil and other things that you use to clean your body, uh, such as washing, not your clothes. Rinse in the mouth after eating. The Prophet ﷺ once ate some uh, mushed barley, and he had wudu on, but before he let the people in Salah ﷺ, he actually rinsed his mouth. That's common sense. Because many of us will attest to the idea or the fact that you could eat certain food that you wind up chewing throughout the salah. Depending on what the food is. And depending on your teeth, you might get some remnants that pop up in the middle of the salah. And, and if you, some of the, according to some of the scholars, obviously swallowing some of this stuff could invalidate your salah. There's a difference of opinion whether eating something in the salah invalidates it or not. I'm not going to go to this very hectic discussion. But... The bottom line is you don't want to be eating or continuing to chew food in the salah. So rinse in the mouth is ideal to cleanse, cleanse it from all that remnants. <coughs> so you can pray with a peace of mind. Otherwise you'll have flashbacks about how tasty the chicken was. When you get that little string stuck between your teeth. And the scholars say if, if you actually get something from between your teeth, you shouldn't eat it. Like you know how you eat chicken and then two hours later you finally get that one thread which was stuck between your teeth the whole time. That you spit out. Don't say I'm going to continue my meal and say Bismillah, Alhamdulillah after you're done with it. Uh, praising Allah after finishing eating. And there's a great deal of virtue in this. 
I don't know how many of us actually do this consistently, or, or how many of the variations of the ad'iya do we know. But this is a, again, an area of a lot of reward. Sufficient to know from the hadith of the Prophet wherein where Allah says, Allah is pleased with his slave. When he eats something and praises him for it, and he drinks or drinks something and he praises him for it. The hadith is narrated by Muslim. That's beautiful. Allah becomes pleased with you. If you ate and said, Alhamdulillah, you're eating anyways. So you get Allah's pleasure, which can't be, you can't put a price tag on it. I mean, you cannot enumerate how fantastic and beautiful it is for Allah to be pleased with one of us. And it's done by merely eating and saying, Alhamdulillah. How we miss out on that is mind-blowing. Let us deal with the several ways that we can implement in praising Allah Azza wa Jal. <coughs> in the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Anas, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever eats some food then says, Alhamdulillah alladhi at'amani hadha, wa razaqanihi min ghayri hawlim minni wa la quwa, which means, O oh, praise is due to Allah who has fed me this and provided me with it, with no power or strength on my part, his previous sins will be forgiven. Wow! I mean, you pray the whole Ramadan. You fast the whole Ramadan because you want And you pray every night in Ramadan because you want the same thing. And inshallah, if we live to Laylatul Qadr, we will do the same thing. I mean, all these things we do for us to reach this. And here you have it. With every time you eat. <coughs> and mashallah, some eat 20 times a day. Every time you eat, yaqi, if you say this, Allah will forgive you previous sins. How do we not know it? It's amazing. It's one line. One liner. You can find it in online with a quick search. You can find it in the book, The Muslim Fortress or The Fortress of a Muslim. All of these adayah are there. Subhanallah, ajeeb. Another one. Um, <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ would say, Allahumma, Allahumma at'amta wa saqayta wa hadayta wa ahyayta. Falaka alhamd ala ma a'atayta. O oh Allah, you have fed, given, drink, guided, and brought to life. So praise be to you for what you have given. Another dua. And the scholars say you should, you should, we, could, we should learn as many as possible and apply a different dua each time. From the sunnah is to apply those different ad'iyah so that you don't have one dua throughout your life. You can also say, Alhamdulillahi hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fihi ghayra makfiyin wala muwaddi'in wala mustaghnan anhu rabbana. Praise be to Allah, much good and blessed praise. O oh our Lord, you are not in need of anyone and we cannot do without your favor nor dispense with it. And the hadith is narrated by Bukhari. <coughs> and there are many, but we're not going to say them all because for the most part, no one is going to memorize it from the lecture. But knowing that there are, uh, there are variants of these ad'iyah is beneficial. So we could refer to them in our own time and hopefully memorize them. I'm sure it is easy. Any of us can memorize the surah. So you're familiar with memorizing Arabic terminology. You can memorize the dua and implement it from now onwards, inshallah. Tayyip, also praying for the host. This is another abandoned sunnah. You know, now we just hear, hey, thanks a lot, man. It was good food. Uh, if we really do it yani, the Islamic way, jazakallah khairan. But there are actually particular ad'iyah tailored by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and there's nothing more beneficial and more blessed than the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in regards to this. Uh, for example, the Prophet would say, May fasting people break their fast with you. May the righteous eat your food and may the angels send blessings upon you. This is again from the ad'i of the Prophet ﷺ for the host when you are invited to food, uh, to eat food at someone's home. Type, general etiquettes regarding food. Not criticizing the food. That is I think the most difficult thing for us. Oh wow, it's a lot of phones today. Uh, please put the phones on vibrate. Zakum la khair. That is the most difficult one today because we are habitually critique critics who critique everything. So, I, I, for example, me personally, I struggle the most with this. 
I have the tendency to want to criticize and it's a struggle. It's an ongoing struggle for me to learn how to zip my mouth and not criticize the food, right? Uh, there are different discussions which we will discuss inshallah. But generally speaking, do not criticize the food. It, and when it comes to the spouses and the ultra sensitive wife, that becomes even more impo most important. That you don't say something that will uh, break her heart and hurt her feelings. Uh, yeah. So the Prophet ﷺ never, criti never criticized any food. If he liked it, he would eat it. If he didn't like it, he would leave it. And that's important to understand. That if you didn't like it, you leave it. Those of us who are in the presence of that person should also understand that that person might be following the sunnah and leave him alone. You know, leave, if the person dislikes the food, there's no point in trying to insist on having them eat something that they dislike because then you are forcing criticism. It becomes, there's no way out. Look, I, I don't eat this type of food or uh, it's too salty for me or whatever. Then you're forced to say something. So if we all apply the sunnah, the person didn't criticize, you understood that he has an issue with the food, you left him alone, everybody will be at peace, right? If you start instigating, then you are forcing him now to abandon the sunnah and it's going to get ugly afterwards. Um, and so, uh, for example, and now what we said, طيب, uh, khair. And now what we said, for the examples, don't say it's too salty or too sour or not salty enough or thick or thin or not well cooked. All of this won't fly. Obviously, if you're in a restaurant and you ordered a steak that is well done and they brought it... Uh, uh, you know, not done, you can ask him to fix that. Because some people, when they don't understand like logic in some way, and they just want to follow the sunnah, they, they miss out on certain things. Say, I'm not going to criticize the food. So they bring you some old food at the restaurant and say, Alhamdulillah, just eat it. La akhi, you paid money to get fresh food. So if the food has a problem, now you may criticize the food for that purpose. Because you're not offending the restaurant. You know, this is their job. Whereas if you're at someone's home and you say this food is too salty, what do you think they're going to think? That's not nice. If you say this, that's not... Now, some of the scholars say that also has to do with the formality and the relationship between you and that person. Meaning if you, you guys are close enough and you know that there's no issue, then they say that there's no issue either. If your buddies, as they say, and they're not going to be offended by your comments, then they, you could, you know, basically turn a blind eye. That doesn't apply. <laughs> the whole idea behind it is not to offend the person offering you food by criticizing their food. Part of the eating or the etiquettes of eating is moderation. <laughs> moderation in eating and not filling the stomach. And that is where it becomes very painful. Because we are ajib, ajib in this area. Uh, people brag, they, they show off about the amount of food that they're able to consume to the degree you think you're sitting with a dinosaur. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. They're like, it's something that they show off. Yani I could have, oh this Fud Ruckers, I could have three of those Akhi. Is that beautiful? No. Because we have a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that says that the believer eats with one stomach, in one stomach, and the disbeliever eats in seven. And I've experienced this in real life. I was eating with non-Muslims, and I'm baffled. Especially when you go to an op open buffet, that's like probably the last place you want to go to as a Muslim, because that's where you, you're going to have a hard time controlling the, you know, the, the, the intake, the food intake. People eat so much, they're tiny people. Yeah, the, the amount of food they eat is more than their whole mass. The body, I don't understand where the food goes. And some of them stay in that all you can eat place for like four or five hours. They go through shifts. Eating, recycling, <laughs> digesting, whatever, start the whole process again. And I'm like, wow, like what's going on here today? You know, this, this, I got full like 
from the first 10 bites. And believe it or not, that is the sunnah. That is, the, that is how our salaf used to be. That is why the Prophet ﷺ, I mean if you think about this hadith, it's mind-blowing. That the worst container, the worst container that the son of Adam fills is his stomach. Sufficient for you is a few mouthfuls, a few mouthfuls to keep your back straight. If you're having a party, if you want to go all out, then we look, look at the, the gradual, uh, the, the graduality of the discussion. If you're just, it's your day, one third for food, one third for drink, and one third for air, for you to breathe. Really? Now compare this to us today. Where is that? Non-existent. Illa man rahim Allah, this is almost non-existent. Last time you ate a third and third and third, where after you were done eating, there's room for more. But you just walked away respectfully. It almost never happens. We are in the habit of eating till we're filled every time. There are exceptions to the rule. There was a time when Abu Huraira <coughs> was drinking milk and he was full already and the Prophet ﷺ told him to continue to drink. That's why the scholars, they say there are occasions where you went to this all you can eat open buffet and so ma'alish, you knocked yourself out. But as if this is your يعني, manhaj every day for every meal, we have an issue. And that leads to so many diseases. And this is why we have this. And this is why I'm wearing this today, because I know some of you are thinking, what in the world is going on here? But this is why I felt that we want to promote this healthy lifestyle among Muslims, just to create awareness, because it's part of our deen. It is an abandoned part of our deen, and the amount of things that are related to it are so many. The, the, the ratio or the rate of people dying from... Uh, diseases related to obesity and overeating or eating a lot of sugar, diabetes is crazy. All of these processed food that we eat, what we feed our children, these gummy bears. And, and what is a gummy bear? This, what is this stuff anyways? It's, uh, Allah, it's not food. Ligaments of different animals with the color additives and preservatives and uh, E59 and C66. And it's like, I don't even know what this is. You just read, it's like a tiny little thing. And then the list of nutritious values, everything is like zero, 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 zero. There's no, nothing in it. And then sugar, 18 grams. And then we say to the kid, Twaddal. And then after five minutes, ah, the kids are jumping all over. Hey, sit down, relax. Ya Habibi, ma, you're feeding him anta shayateen al-ins wal jinn. So what do you want the kid to do? Uh, this is a, a, a byproduct of what we eat. And you know, you go through the supermarket, you will find all types of junk food that we eat on a regular basis. And we are addicted to those things. I know, you know, and the same thing goes to f fizzy drinks, or what my, one of my kids called it fuzzy drinks, mistakenly. Uh, you know, these things again, you like them, they taste good, but this is something that we need to get over. You know, again, you can reward yourself with a cheat meal, as they say, every now and then. Alhamdulillah. But it, could, it shouldn't be part of our diet. Have some fresh juice, you know. Have something good for you that doesn't have so much sugar, so much different ingredients that are bad for you. Um, so, يعني, we cannot stress the issue of moderation. <coughs> and eating and, and taking it easy. And once you control your food intake, then you can you know, do some exercise. We should be again, uh, the, the Muslim world versus the rest of the world to some degree is behind, behind in this area. And we shouldn't. We shouldn't be behind, not from a religious point of view, not from a worldly point of view. We always emphasize that we want the Muslims to be the pioneers, the leaders, and everything. If you're working in marketing, then you need to be the best. If you are a salesman, you need to be the best. If you are in the medical field, you need to be the best. In every area, we need to be at the forefront. 
because that will give us positions of leadership and then we can control the environment. We can control the surroundings. We can call the shots. We can make, we can establish uh, Islam in some way according to our ability and our life. When you're not in that position, you're being told what to do, what you can do, what you cannot do. Oh no, you can't pray. You cannot pray right now. Pray later at home. But it's Salah time. Well, your boss is not having it. If you were the boss, would anyone be telling you you can't pray? I mean, you do whatever you want. You cannot force your employees to pray. See, this is prayer time. It's a break time. And people will start praying slowly but surely. It makes a big difference. You have no idea how important it is. So another area which is um, abandoned. And you know, if you subscribe or if you go to the Facebook page, One Way to Fitness, we have tips on the different foods we should eat, the different foods we should avoid, some different exercises, things to help. Nothing, that, nothing professional, nothing that requires a degree, but at least general health tips that will help people uh, uh, prog you know, move forward with this. Alhamdulillah, the feedback we have received is many people became more uh, conscious of their food intake and they became more concerned about what they're eating and to exercising. And it's showing some good results. So we, ha we hope and pray that Allah Azza wa Jal puts a blessing in that. Eating and drinking from vessels of gold and silver. Yay or nay? Nay. The Prophet ﷺ said, do not wear silk or brocade and do not drink from vessels of gold and silver or eat from plates thereof. They are for them in this world and for us in the hereafter. So if you want to enjoy eating from gold and silver vessels, then that would be in Jannah. بِإِذْنْ وَاحِدْ أَحَدْ In this dunya, it is not for us Muslims to do that. Uh, <coughs> Another area which requires uh, some discussion and elaboration is the, uh, the idea of eating in a group. Eating in a group or eating individually. Uh, the scholars always recommend that we eat in a group because there's a, blessings, there's a blessing in the jama'ah. And so unless you have some really strict dietary uh, you know, food, foods or whatever, or you can't really share, it is always better and recommended to share your food with your fellow brothers and sisters rather than eating on your own. That is the fundamental principle. Uh, this is for the one with the food. For the one without the food, if you're dealing with strangers or people that you barely met, it is not from the etiquettes or good manners to ask for someone's food. Like you see someone with like one, one food item and then you say, يعني, let me have it. And that person may have this as the only food they will have for the whole day and you're like, then they give it to you and they make dua against you for the rest of their lives. You know what I'm saying? Of course, nobody's going to be that uh, vicious. But you know, show some consideration. Some people don't think Always put yourself in other people's shoes. Yani, oh, the, 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 hand, <laughs> the hand that is giving is always better than the hand that is receiving. And that is the, just a fundamental principle. So these are some of the etiquettes and manners pertaining to how we deal with each other. Uh, showing generosity, being kind, favoring others with the best type of food over ourselves is from the sunnah. To, to offer the guest the, the best type of food. So that is in a nutshell... Uh, some of the etiquettes pertaining to uh, eating and drinking, which for whatever reason are abandoned uh, for the most part. But inshallah ta'ala, now that they have been addressed and highlighted, we can start implementing them from the very next meal. And so it's always beautiful when there's knowledge, when we learn certain things, it always changes our perspective on things. You know what I mean? Like the, the uh, rituals become an act of worship. You notice that whenever there's knowledge, it changes the, the ritual to an act of worship. Otherwise, it would become a ritual. It would remain to be a ritual. So for example, you can pray Taraweeh every night. And we've been praying Taraweeh every night. Then a person reminds you something about Taraweeh, something about the Sunnah, something about certain ayat. Then when you pray the very next Salah, you feel, you feel differently. You feel that you've benefited from that reminder. 
And so it's a blessing from Allah that these reminders come to us so that we, from this moment onwards, when we engage in what we have been engaging in anyways, now we can look at it from another perspective and incorporate the good intentions to seek Allah's pleasure. And you never know. It could be that you enter paradise because of your stomach. Not that you're going to force your way in with a big belly, right? And that's not what I meant. As in, because of following these etiquettes of the Prophet ﷺ, we can now gain reward and attain Allah's pleasure. هَذَا وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمْ وَصَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَى بِيرٍ مُحَمَدٍ If you have any questions related to the topic first, then we will entertain those. Otherwise, we can discuss other questions accordingly. Yes, brother. While drinking the zamzam, zamzam water. Zamzam water, yes. Whether we have to sand or sit. Alhamdulillah, excuse me. Very good question. Uh, the, the, I didn't discuss this in the lecture on purpose because of the controversy or the difference of opinion among the scholars about uh, eating and drinking while sitting or while standing. Even though, the, the, from my understanding, the majority of the scholars prefer that you sit down when you eat. And some of them go to the degree that it is obligatory to eat and drink while sitting. And some say it, there's a flexibility. What they agree about, as far as I know, is that Zamzam water is an exception to the rule. Because we have a clear-cut evidence that the Prophet ﷺ drank Zamzam while standing. So some of them say Zamzam is one of these things which, which is an exception, as in, you can drink while standing. Some of them say, no, it's the Sunnah to stand. Because the Prophet ﷺ stood. And so you drink Zamzam while standing. Some say, it, and the, the popular opinion is up to you. Whether you are sitting because you want to follow the sunnah or you're standing because you're thinking about the prophets pray, uh, uh, drinking while standing, both are okay, inshallah. Very good question. Zakallah khair. Is there anything in the sunnah about uh, the number of meals the prophet had in a day? Not that I am aware. Yeah. Not, not that I'm aware of. No, Allahu a'lam. But but what we know is that he had many days, alayhi salam, where he would have to tie stones to his stomach because of the lack of food. So. Uh, and generally, he never got even bread. He, the, the house of Prophet never even got filled or full of eating bread. There was always lack of food. Uh, nowadays, alhamdulillah, we have, we have blessings. Shukran. Where we have a lot of food in our fridge. Uh, so if, if the deen doesn't stipulate something, then it becomes whatever the culture, whatever your culture, whatever is normal among the people. Now we have breakfast, lunch, dinner. And some people have three breakfasts, four lunch, and six dinners, mashallah, tabarakallah. But usually it's one for each. It's fine. As long as you don't eat too much. You don't overeat. Um, after going back home, my brother would say just one third. And that's enough. And he is a growing boy. So what would you say about that? He is very thin and tall. Oh. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. If from my understanding, we need to ask a scholar whether these things apply to kids. I don't believe so. Allahu uh, alam, because obviously children are in a growing uh, stage and they need protein and they need food. So that that could be different. This is usually addressing grown people who eating too much is going to result in health problems. So this is something that, uh, to logical to some degree, a, a kid somebody has lack of vitamins and lack of you know whatever nutrition then that person has to eat so that they don't disappear one day you see clothes walking around and so nobody's going to tell him you know he's that skinny and tall he say one third for food yeah he's he's dying he said no 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 but this is common sense right common sense so the one who needs to eat obviously or the doctor tells him you're not eating enough you need to eat this type of food you need to eat this much of food that's a whole other discussion but the general framework of eating is that one third for those who are in good health and shape. Now, um, in European countries, uh, as you said, there is an opinion that uh, you can either uh, eat the food of the, the people of the book, and then there are people who are saying that because in the European Union, it's very clearly mentioned that uh, the the animal or the chicken or whatever it is, <laughs> it's uh, taste, so it's uh, like in a state of uh, unconsciousness before it's cut. So in, in that case, if there is there is anything uh, said on that? Yeah, they say that the, the, the scholars have an issue with the dead animal being slaughtered after it died. Not 
the one which has been tasered or electro electrocuted or whatever. So the, the whole thing boils down to did that animal die from whatever they did to it? Or was it still alive at the time of slaughter? Because what they usually do is they do something, beat it up or electrocute it or, or taser it, and then it, it, it dies and then they slaughter it. Once it dies and it's slaughtered afterwards, then خلاص, it renders it as meat, as haram. But if it's still alive, then the scholars usually consider it to be okay because of certain evidences to this effect. That if you catch something and it still hasn't died and you do the, you do the nahar, then it's, it's acceptable. So whatever they do in their, in the, their unions or whatever, I'm not really aware of. But it boils down to whether the animal has died or not before whatever means they use to kind of tame it before they slaughter it because they can't deal with the reaction of the animal. But nothing beats the Islamic way. Now, even have different physical activities, is it uh, necessary to like, like if someone is an athlete and uh, he requires more food, is it necessary to have uh, one third in that case as well? Again, this, this is similar to the previous question. <coughs> If the person is an athlete and they need muscle growth and they need to eat a, a certain amount of food, then this becomes almost like a medical treatment and it becomes an exception to the rule. The, the idea is what is good for the body is that you don't overeat, right? But usually an athlete doesn't overeat except that he either burns it or that he turns it into muscle. So there's, there's a process for that person uh, and that's another discussion. We're talking about the person who doesn't have any activity and every time they're taking all this calorie and they don't burn any of it, it results in now them becoming larger and, and more fat and more obese, then that becomes an issue. But if you have some activity which is taking care of that food intake, then it is looked at differently, obviously. There's, it's, it's, it's not like a black and white. There's, there are many gray areas in this discussion. Now. Well, uh, A tough topic. Oh, yeah, Allah, Bismillah. And, uh, nowadays, uh, we are uh, with the in, in Jama. And so, if you wake up in Sohar, we can we pay two rakats? If you wake up? Sohar. 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 Can we pay two rakats if you finish with the at the Jama? Two rakats? Yeah. For what? To which two rakats? The Sunnah of Fajr? No, before the Allah is coming in the first heaven, we can. You Ask. already prayed with him? Yeah. So, why would you pray two rakats? To ask for you next time. Allah. I don't know. I know that some of the scholars say if someone prayed with her, uh, and they, they wanted to pray again, that they may do something of the sort, but I, I don't have detailed knowledge about it. I mean, usually the safest thing is if you prayed with her, you're not supposed to pray with her twice. Khalas, you have the Sunnah of Fajr, you can seek forgiveness. You can, in Fajr, you can seek forgiveness, you can stay until sunrise. Making dua and seeking forgiveness. I mean, you have many other opportunities than doing something which we don't know whether the Prophet ﷺ did or not. Or something that we know that he didn't do, for example. Unless you have evidence to the contrary. I, I personally don't know. Is it mentioned in the Sunnah, like uh, the sequence of food that you eat? Uh, to eat fruits, or drink water first, then fruits, then you know that. Not, not that I know of. I know that they use the ayah in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, I believe. Uh, some, of this, some of the people say that this is an evidence that you begin with the fruits before meat, for example. Because in the Quran it mentioned the faqiha first and then lahm uh, al But I don't know of anything else personally again. I read in the Dada Ma'ad, Sheikh al Ayyo. Mentioned this. Had. This is what I said. I mean, is it from Sunnah to or just? Uh, what did he say? That to eat fruit, then the seeds, then the normal. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, Ibn Qayyim is Ibn Qayyim, and you know, as the book of Tub al uh, there are a lot of these things which are based on uh, tajarub, experimentation, and and you know, it becomes like a medical observation. And as long as it doesn't conflict with the Sunnah, then it's is to be you know, you don't you don't say it's wrong, it's neither right nor wrong, it becomes an option that you have. So many things which are proven from a health point of view that don't conflict with the sunnah and you know that they're beneficial according to studies, go ahead by all means. No one can tell you that you shouldn't. 
Uh, but if we have an evidence of the Prophet because you know Abu Qayyim experimented and he came up with these observations, even a lot of the things in Ruqya, in the area of Ruqya, you don't find that it's direct from the Prophet It's based on the fundamentals of Ruqya with experimentation. No issue, the scholars say no issue, go ahead. But just don't say this is the Sunnah. But you can recommend that it's good for your health to eat, you know, such and such food or this type of food because of the benefits that it has in, for your body, even though there's nothing established in the Sunnah, no issue. If I would eat less food with the intention that I will not harden my heart or I should take care of my body, which intention is better? Both. Both intentions. This, there are certain things where you cannot have dual intentions uh, or, or triple intentions and there are things where you can have many, many intentions and all of them can be integrated into one act of worship. So I don't know which, obviously the heart is the most important thing, but then again your body is, a, is a, something that Allah entrusted you with to look after and to take care of and therefore you have to fulfill this trust. Uh, and so, you know, both are of significance. So having both intentions without having to put them, you know, 65, 63% and then, you know, whatever, 37 or whatever the other number is, doesn't have to be this way. You just have the intention to do both and simplify your life. You don't go into such detail where, you know, you complicate things that are simple. All these intentions are good. If your mother wants you to eat uh, or to eat more, eat less, and then you add that intention to make your mom happy, bardu, it's all good. You can have all these intentions at the same time. Now, yes, sir. Is there any restriction like while having food? If we cut the food with the knife in the left hand and later have it with the fork on the right hand, so is there any like restriction to cut the food? No, because you're not eating. Okay. Yeah, you you don't have to cut cut the, with the right hand and eat with the right hand. No, this is the problem. Is the Western way is that they hold the knife with the right hand yeah. and the fork with the left hand. It, it breaks my heart when I see a Muslim wind up eating with the left hand because this is, I guess, the way. That's, that's why most, most of the Muslims switch the other way. You know? Yeah, I reverse it. Yeah. I cut with the left hand and I eat with the right hand and it's like, you know, who cares? It's not like that somebody's going to come and say, hey, swap. It's like, dude, just khalas, you know, we're eating. You can eat with the left, I can eat with the right, that's my business. Yeah, no, you can use both. You can, you, you can eat with both hands. Mind you, if you're eating a burger, and it's a big old burger, you don't have to eat it with one hand where you, half of it falls because you're trying to, you, it's okay. But you don't want to eat with the left hand, or you, you don't want to eat with the left hand and put that finger. That's what the, that's what the issue is. Right. So I guess this time, for real, we're going to stop. Right. Subhanakallah, bihamdik, shada la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka atubu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.